We're delighted to introduce session 36, Then We Came to an End. We have Joshua Ferris in conversation with Chiki Sarkar. Joshua Ferris, the author of Then We Came, then we Came to an End, which was nominated for the National Book Award and longlisted for the Guardian First Book Award. He was selected for the New Yorker's prestigious 20 under 40 list. He's going to be in conversation with Chiki Sarkar, the publisher of Juggernaut Books and a former publisher of Penguin Random House India. Let's welcome them on stage with a huge round of applause. It's uh, 11 o'clock at night where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you for getting up and being here at 10 a.m. Um, and I'm totally excited to do this because I, this gave me an opportunity to read Joshua Ferris's work which I hadn't before, so I, I wrote an email to him saying that I've been inside Joshua Ferris's head this last few days. It's not a good place to be. It's a very strange head, um, it, and maybe we'll get, we'll give you guys, a, I mean, I don't know how many of you have read his wonderful books, and I've in particular spent this last few days on his last book, which is a collection of short stories called The Dinner Party. Um, and uh, Josh, I want to start with your acknowledgments because in uh, the, the dinner party's 11 stories about, uh, in words of various reviewers, fucked up men, losers, doofuses, jerks, and in, and in Joshua's own words. And in his acknowledgments, he writes a thanks to his editor, I think, and says, thank you for not confusing me with my characters. Not my editor, actually. She probably does. Yeah. <laughs> it's my agent. That <laughs> it's I'm your talking. agent. My agent and my wife. <laughs> And so I want to start with that. Uh, I did, so, so you've created these 11 men, and, and, and the voice is often so intimate that, of course, one wonders whether Joshua Ferris lurks in the minds of these very strange. And we'll talk a little bit about what makes these men so strange and messed up. Um, but, uh, but are you like the tw 11 men you've written about? Am I like them? Are you at all a little bit? I'm sure that I'm a little like them. I'm enough not like them, though, that I could write about them, uh, you know, well and objectively. I want to thank you for, for doing this. Uh, what you don't know is that Cheeky filled in uh, at the last minute for John Freeman, who couldn't make it, and so you've really worked very hard to get here and be prepared, so thank you for that. Yeah, no, it's fab. I just flew in. I've just come straight from the airport. Um, but let's, let's talk about the stories. So I, I'm going to say a few, and Joshua, and then I'm going to go fill in the blanks, and I want you to say it. So, just to give you a sense of sort of how strange and interesting these stories are, what, what's kind of interesting about these stories is that when you first read them, you think, oh, this is going to be a well-observed comedy of manners about men and women and all of it. And then they, almost all of them end or sort of upturn themselves by the sort of end of the story. So everything you expect the story to be sort of upturns. And the upturning is kind of so dramatic uh, and so unexpected. I mean, it, it's a proper, you know, it's a conscious upturn. It's not even like, oh, this is a mild twist in the tale. So let me give an example of the opening story, which is called The Dinner Party, and thus the, the name of the collection. It's about a couple who are preparing dinner for another couple. And when you start, when you read it, it's about the husband of the wife, uh, the hosts, the host husband, and he's sort of moaning and bitching, and he doesn't want to really have this dinner party. He really doesn't like that couple that were going to come. And he's being sarcastic and funny, and you're like laughing along with them, and you feel like, oh, this is a slice of life we all understand. One couple, kind of yuppie couple, about to host another yuppie couple, bitching them. And, 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 and there's a kind of slightly human, slightly tragic dimension to it, because this couple's childless. 
and the hidden subtext is they want a child and you, they know that this other couple's gonna come that day and say to them, you know, we're, we're gonna have a child. So they're sort of preparing for the bad news. So you feel like the story is gonna be about, you know, New York, urban New Yorkers, dinner parties, lack of having children, all of this stuff, right? Except that what, how it ends is that this, this, the guest couple don't show up and our host husband goes to their home because they're worried, they think something's gone terribly wrong, there's been an accident or something, how come they haven't shown up? And what they're doing is they're hosting a dinner party, another party, and it's so surreal. And when I, the, when I hit that moment, I thought, did I just miss something? Like, did I, I had to go back like three pages. To the, I, and so there's this sort of moment where you think, what? And, and then as he's sort of wondering about this party as if it's a bad dream, and, 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 and the story takes the, from, from being this kind of clever, subtle, socially realized story, it suddenly turns into a kind of weird, surreal, bad dream moment. He's sort of wandering around this party that he hasn't been invited to. And he bumps into the, the, the guest couple's wife, who then ha has a kind of extraordinary uh, moment with him where she sort of abuses him and rails at him. Um, and then he returns home and other things happen. And I wanna like, so when I say that, you know, I've been inside Joshua Ferris's strange mind, this is what I mean, is that, you know, these are, every one of these stories go a certain way and you expect them to go a certain way and then they completely don't. Um, this, you know, they, Tell me a little bit about how you write these stories. Do you, d does the ending, these strange endings, take you by surprise? Do they come first? Do you know they're always going to be there? I don't usually know they're gonna be there. What I like about what you're saying for me is that I've tried to always make it like a dream. Uh, sometimes it's a bad dream, so sometimes it's straight out of a nightmare. But the surreality and the changes in direction, the swervings, the unexpected, um, happenings, um, that's my goal with every story, and with the novels too. I was going up, I, I live at the bottom of a hill um, in upstate New York, and I was taking my son to school, and we were, it had just snowed, and so there was probably about an inch of snow on the, on the street, and as we were heading up, there's this blind curve, I mean, it's, it's really nasty, it's a nasty curve, you can only go five, 10 miles an hour up this curve. And as we were heading up it, uh, both of us, he and I, at the same moment in time, saw this enormous snow plow barreling down this blind curve. And we both sort of laughed at the same moment. It was terrifying, but it was also kind of funny because it was like exactly the last thing you want to see on this blind curve hill. And I was delighted that the boy in back laughed because I had laughed too. Like, of course this is what we're going to encounter. This thing was so large and it had its large big plow kind of coming right at us and it was life threatening and I sort of veered off the road and had to back down. But that's how I experienced life. Everything is just a, kind of like a snow plow coming at me at any moment in time. And so even, you know, it is true that so many of these men in, and it's mostly about men, there are a couple of stories about women, but most of them are about men are kind of awful because it allows me the opportunity to play with reality in a way that I'm perfectly in control of and I'm manipulating a guy usually that nobody will really care about if he's you know, messed with in, in, severe, in severe ways. And, but it's <clears> interesting <throat> because the worlds you set these stories in are completely, they're not just real, they're so sort of, you know, it's a, it's a couple having a dinner party, uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, a, a man getting a weird tour guy ride, uh, a, a tour uh, uh, in Prague. Um, uh, there's a very, very touching, it's a story that I kind of sort of, I think in some ways it was your most, it was your saddest story about um, a young boy who's, she has a, he has a single mom and she's obviously always in relationships and, and the story begins with her having a breakup with yet another boyfriend. Uh, so they're completely like, they're, they're, the, so what I mean is that it's weird because you haven't, I wouldn't say it's an Alice in Wonderland world, 
but you, you, you're tricking us readers because you, you know, and you take your first novel, uh, Joshua's first novel, which was, uh, you know, many say is one of the great kind of skewerings of office culture and how we are in, in corporate life. Um, this is how it ends. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's super real, right? It's the place for social realism uh, in many ways. You know, you, it, it wouldn't surprise me if a, an Alice Munro story came out of this or something like that. Uh, are you ever tempted f to, to give in completely to those surreal moments? To well, I would argue that in Then We Came to the End, there are some to I mean, just like, if I say like stapler and office chair and apple, um, I could do anything with the characters. Because you're like, I know where we are. We're in an office park. It looks very familiar. Um, and so I could play around with the surreality of, you know, people doing crazy things, things that don't really happen in an office. But because you recognized the setting, I was free to do it, and you, you were like, yeah, that happens all the time. So I, am, I, I, you have to be careful, I think, with the impulse to be surreal and dreamlike because it could very quickly sort of pounce on your, uh, sort of grind to a halt your suspension of disbelief, where suddenly you're like, I, I'm not actually buying it anymore. So it's a delicate calibration, especially when you start the story or the novel in the real world and you start to veer in the direction of the fantastical, it, you know, it throws up some red flags. But I try to push it in that direction as much as possible. That's what's fun for me as a writer. We, I want to go back to something you said that was interesting. You said you, you liked, you sort of were ha having characters that were unpleasant. Um, it helped you, it kind of liberated you from sort of, it could allow you to kind of go be not nice to them in the end. Yeah. As a writer, is that right? I mean, do you feel that you can, if you had nicer people, you'd be more constrained as a writer? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, you don't want nice things. You want you don't want bad things to happen to, bad, to nice people. You want bad things to happen to bad people. Um, but I think that you know, one of the moments in time when I realized I, I had become a writer was the moment when I stopped worrying about whether or not this man that I was writing about was going to be confused for me. Yeah and did something that I would never do personally, um, and, ma and it made him truly a kind of an atrocious person. And I could look at him um, as somebody who I didn't like, and I could treat him accordingly. Now, the question really became at that point, to what extent was I just writing a mor morality tale? You know, At what point does a kind of like Alice Munro story turn into an O. Henry story? And those, were, those are also delicate negotiations because you don't want to just sit there and sort of like moralize or be better than your characters. So even though I sort of choose very, very flawed people to write about, I also have to find something in them as irredeemable as they may be that sort of connects me to them and hopefully connects the reader to them as well. When did that moment happen when you thought I've become a real writer? When, when, when was that first character that you wrote and you thought, Wow, and I completely understand because, of course, the classic thing for any first writer is, you know, they say that on the this is just sort of cliches, but on that that the first the first novel or the first book of a writer is often, you know, it's mined from their whole lives, uh, and then once that's done, they're sort of facing the abyss of what it means to be a real writer. You know, you've yeah. taken all your early material; it's gone into that book. What yeah. do you do next? Yeah. Um, did you? When did you have that moment? There are a lot of moments in the first book, but I think probably with the stories that you're referencing, there's a, a story about a couple who's had, the man has had an affair, and they're just sort of recovering from it, and they're coming up from the subway uh, to go to dinner with her parents, and he's, f uh, like, he's got in this pocket, he's like fingering a dollar bill, this sort of dollar bill that he's found, and he keeps passing the neediest people, and he keeps sort of, rubbing that dollar bill, which has kind of been furred because it's gone through the wash. And, you know, frankly, if, I, if I'm, like, I'm, if I'm in writing about myself, that dollar bill is gone. It's like, because I, I give money away. And I'm like, I, you know, uh, that's how nice I am. I give my dollars <laughs> away. But this guy kept this dollar and kept passing the most needy people. They could really use this dollar. And he even remarks upon them. 
He knows what he should do, probably. But that dollar becomes sort of instrumental in what happens at the end of the story. So I need him to hold on to that dollar. But I also need you to know that he's kind of not a good dude. And you need to know that outside of the context of his relationship with his wife because, you know, it's kind of, it's easy enough to blame somebody for infidelity or, you know, uh, become moralistic based on uh, things that exist outside of the story. I need you to know that this guy is not all that great from within the, the rules of the story. So you kind of get that. And then there's a moment where his, he and his wife separate because she's not happy with him. And he sort of gets rescued by his in-laws. And they want to know where she is. And he says, you know what? It's none of your business. And they kind of take that and back away and say, you know what? He's probably right. It's none of, none of our business what's going on. And it's because he's cheated on her. And after they say, that's fine, he lies to them. And he says, here's what I've really done. I've, I've upset her because I tell her, I've, I've told her she's working at the hospital too much. And this is a straight up lie. And it's the moment at which I no longer worry about anyone confusing me for the narrator, for the, or for the character, for the circumstance. It's when I'm writing fiction and things have taken off into a new realm, both sort of artistically and morally, you know? And of course, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting because while most of your, I'm going to stick to these men because they're so, when you read this book, you'll see that, that, the, that one of the kind of strengths of this book is that there are these 11 strange men uh, and you're kind of gripped by them. Um, but they're, but they're, they're strange in a spectrum of sort of, they're, 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 there's no one, there's of course no such thing as normal, but they're fairly normal and jerky. But there's one or two characters where you're really, you move from that to someone with genu genuine psychosis. Would you agree? Like, and I think. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, more than one. More than more one. Than one. <laughs> but the one that I particularly remember, and it's a very, I think in some ways, for me, it was the most accomplished story. It, um, it's a story of a, a, a man who, you know, he, be so one of the interesting things Joshua does in this bo uh, book, and is that he's constantly tricking you as a reader. So he starts with, you know, he, the, because they have these first person voices and they're talking confidentially to the reader. You think, oh, he's, he's confiding in us and this is what his problem is. And then you realize, of course, he's, he's, a, he's a proper psychopathic liar and he's lying to you and he's lying to everyone in the, in the story. And, and in this, this character sort of is, you see him, he's rung a doorbell when the story begins because his wife left him. Um, and he goes up the lift and he comes into this house, flat and it's this messy flat of a, a woman whose life has been de currently defined by motherhood. They're just, there's a baby sleeping, there are, you know, slightly like eight-year-olds who've gone to the park, the house is a dip, uh, and he's met this woman like four days ago, and he says, I've come to you because my wife's left me, um, and, you did, I, and he's decided to seduce this woman. Um, and, in the, and, and, and as you sort of see the, the, till the middle of the story, it's this man who has a difficult marriage and he's not understood by his wife and he's alone and he, he's met this woman four days ago and obviously there's been a spark and a connection. He hasn't been able to stop thinking about her. So what you feel you're reading is like an intense, strange love affair that's gonna begin. Uh, and you see the woman who's sort of just a tired, just sort of, much simpler psychologically than she is. He is a woman who's kind of in first flattered, then intrigued, and then sort of is drawn to this man. And so they sort of have a kind of hookup, uh, which is kind of very funny. And then the second part of the story is that he returns home and his wife's there. And all these things he's been saying about his wife is not true. And she says to him, you did it again. Who was it this time? Um, and you realize that he does this Constantly, he goes and seduces women, lies to them about his wife, uh, and she's the sort of real victim in the story because she's sort of accepting it and she's, she knows that this is... Would you say that that was your most fucked up person in this collection? <laughs> yeah, this is the bad guy. He's bad. It's a kind of like wicked fairy tale, actually, because you, you do get the sense that, like, this is really romantic. And like they're really going to be in love, and then 
something very bad, kind of like grim like, you know, the grim fairy tale like um, conclusion to that is devastating on all accounts, and it's really not, it's not good at all. I think I probably took that, when I was a kid, I was in love with like um, amazing stories and the uh, Alfred Hitchcock anthologies. And I remember, I think this was on the TV show Alfred Hitchcock Presents. There was a story about a woman that is viciously, viciously assaulted in her home and then eventually goes to the hospital and her husband, who was not there at the time, comes and picks her up. And it's awful, and you know how awful it is. And on their way out of the hospital, they get in the car, and he's being very tender, and, and they're driving down the street, and she says, there he is. And he says, him? And the woman says, yeah, that's, that's the man who assaulted me. And he goes, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? I'm complete, that's him. And so he follows him into a parking garage, and kills him, attacks him and kills him and, and is completely relieved and she's very relieved and gets back in the car and says, it's done, it's over. And they leave the parking lot and they're driving down the street and she points to the next man and says, that's him. That's the man who's done it. And I've always been very intrigued by this psychosis that leads to innocence falling. And that was probably where that story came from. I was probably just taking it from a cheap TV show. Um, but in a totally different context, in the context of uh, you know, complete seduction and romance, because I feel like the opposite side of him, he wants things that a man wants. He wants to feel like he's the seducer. And I think in this way that is sort of prototypical of his gender and of his, you know, his own confusion, she is sort of typical of hers while also remaining you know, distinct enough that she's not just a mother, she's not just an object of desire, she's also a painter and she wants to be her own person and she's confused by her motivations as a mother and she doesn't want to give way to that so she thinks, I know what I'll do, I'll fall in love with this man, this mess will work itself out somehow and I will be able to paint during the day and we will live a bohemian lifestyle, we'll travel around uh, different islands and it will be very romantic and so she gives way to this only to find out probably sometime in the future that she's made a bad bet. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a story about two people lying, lying well, lying to themselves, well, she's lying to herself. But it's, uh, the thing that, of course, that strikes you about that story and all your other stories is you, you're, you, you don't write about happy marriages, right? Do you, is that just boring as a writer? I think so, yeah. Pretty boring. I mean, I, 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 am, story, right? I am. I am fairly. I'm fairly happily married. I wasn't always happily married. We had some like issues to work out early on. I was uh, a, the ch a child of divorce. I mean, my parents got divorced, you know, like every few weeks, um, and I didn't really know what it meant to be married. So I went into my marriage. I was married in 2004, and I went into my marriage thinking, well, whenever we would have a fight, that would mean that we would have to get a divorce. So I would be like, well, it's over. And she would say, what, what, are, you, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and I would say, well, we're getting a divorce now because we have this fight. And so she sort of had to, at some point in time, come to me and say, you know, you can make marriage what you want it to be. It doesn't have to be this thing. And so. I think I learned so much from her and then started to realize all of the imperfections that I had, all of the problems that I had, all of the assumptions that I had, all the like wrong ideas that I had entered into this institution with, into this like, you know, holy agreement. Uh, and I had done so, so, I had done so, so half-heartedly without recognizing what it really meant to be married. And so we, we got, we came to it together, you know, and now we have a really pretty strong union, but I wouldn't have any idea how to make it interesting on the page. It has to, I mean, if it's going to make it into a book, I'm afraid to say, it's got to kind of be shitty. And that's what's so interesting about fiction is that when, when you're reading fiction, you don't really want the good news. Well, it's like, you know, every unhappy family is unhappy in their own way, right? right? I mean, is that the... Is that right? Is it just easier writing about 
messy things, messed up things, it is lies, infant, all of that. Is that just way more interesting material than, is there anything that's happy that's interesting to write well, about as a writer? Well, you asked what you said, initially you said, is it easier? And it's so much easier to write about the bad. It actually, it, it, it is an, <clears throat> it's an interesting moment nationally in America because all of these fictions have fallen. All of these myths about progress, about hope and change, uh, a lot of things that we believed in in 2000, certainly in 2008 and 2012, have just sort of crumbled, and along with them, so much more. And as I was trying to figure out why it was that my collection of, of stories was about such bad people, um, which I was fine with, like I didn't have any issues with it, some reviewers would say, boy, he, why does he always have to write about such unfortunate individuals? And I was thinking, well, we are still totally seduced, especially critically, by the idea that we should, as fiction writers or as artists, should be propping up the fictions that have fallen rather than tearing them down. And I have to say that I think that's probably the thing that I struggle with most. I don't just mean like the crafty things like how am I going to get this story written or should it be in the first person or the third or boy doesn't write, isn't writing hard and doesn't it suck and aren't I miserable and all that. I mean like the real like, you know, life or night long wrestle with the angel is should I be telling the, the, the bad destroying news in my stories and novels, or should I be actually indulging some of the things that make, that make readers come to books in the first place, like fantasy and romance and redemption, the possibility of redemption and change, and should I be propping those things up and trying to, like, and I, I go back and forth so that if you pick up my first book, you get a sense of yeah. real hope and optimism. Yeah. I was in a different place in life. And then you read the last novel that I put out, and it seems nothing but the dreary news you know, with some comedic asides. And I go back and forth in these large, you know, kind of like moods where sometimes I think, yeah, I should be, I should be indulging fantasy. And sometimes I just think, no, let's tear it all down. Let's tell the truth. And it's a conflict. And what is the truth? That it's not happily ever after. No one really necessarily has anything that works out. Progress is a myth. Facts are discarded for something much more important, like meaning. Um, Doesn't count. War will always will be eternal. There's no afterlife. On, I mean, the truth goes on and on, and it's grim. It's grim. How are you going to tell your children, your son this? How are you going to kind of? I mean, I, I think you know the first stories we probably tell the world is the stories we tell children, right? I mean, that's how sort of fairy tales happen. That was how. How are you going to? My son is fucked, basically. <laughs> I'm not sure that I do such a good job as a parent. I try to be honest, and you know, I mean, it's not easy. I do have to back away from that with my son. I have to be, I have to be a little bit more delicate with that. So, do you think it's more interesting than ever to be a novelist in Trump's America? Do you I think like, it's harder. Oh my God, I've got like. I t tell me who's reading novels, right? Nobody's reading novels because they pick up their phone and they're reading the novel of their lifetime. They're reading the most interesting fictional account ever come along. So it's harder than ever. I mean, I've just been assigned, I've just been asked to write something for McSweeney, so it's putting out uh, petitions against Trump. And my petition, you know, they give you samples or examples, and it's like, you know, I object to this Trump presidency because of, I mean, whatever reason you want to name, right? And I'm objecting because he's taking my job away, you know? Like, I'm, I, I, how can I compete with this guy? You can't compete with this no. guy. So, you know, I think it's harder than ever, frankly. But I also think it's, it's an interesting moment because never before has the art of fiction been more evident on the national stage. I mean, it was really bad during the Bush years because there was a lot of lies, and that was like the first time you got a hint that there was something called a reality-based community. I don't remember, know if you remember this, but out of uh, somebody's mouth came but that's because you guys are believing in the reality-based community, and we're not doing that. Well, over here in the Bush administration, we've been creating our own reality for years. And this was very alarming, and people were quite, well, now it's come fully, I mean, we're really in it now. We're really in the stuff. 
And um, but never before has it been more yeah. important to understand what fiction means, to understand how it's written, how to read it, how to discern it. But let's talk a little bit more about it. I mean, when you say that, you know, you, what, what Americans are reading are the great, is the greatest novel of their lives, it's just the, it's that what's playing out on your stage is like your, the climaxes of a Joshua Ferris story. I mean, they're all, it's just one bad dream after the other, and right. you couldn't imagine it. You couldn't right. make this up, right? Um, so what, what does that mean for you as a writer? Does that mean, how do your stories change? Do I they think, change? Do I they have think to change? Here's, here's what's weird about it. So much has been revealed to be important to the citizen, like the idea of America, the idea of progress, the ideas that this man in particular has destroyed, that it's at a moment in time where some of that stuff, because vague as it is, sort of like, tenuous and maybe even totally fictional is vitally important to us as human beings. So they actually do need to be rebuilt. They need to be, we need to have uh, an idea that there is something more than the mean existence that is put forth on the national level. So it sounds like what you're saying is you need, you need those novels that, you know, you need something which is extra hopeful. Yeah. Yeah. Extra earnest? Yeah. yeah. Is that right? Yeah, Joshua, are we yeah. saying that you're going to change we've completely come, as a writer? We've, we've come <laughs> full circle. That's exactly what's, what's needed. And it's not because we, I want everybody to like indulge in their fantasy life. It's because, in fact, like, uh, you know, Barack Obama was elected in 2008 because he had a, not in, in part, but in large part because he had a story. He had a story to tell. It was a convincing story. It was a hopeful story. It was an extraordinary story. And he allowed us to believe that that story could also be our story, could also be the story of America. With the destruction of that kind of hope, with the destruction of that important, vital fiction that we have to believe abides in the world, what do we have but to confront the truth? The fact that people are mean, the, fa the fact that people uh, live in this brutal way without concern, without care, without um, empathy. How are you gonna? How are you gonna write this hyper? How will people write this hyper sincere novel? It almost feels like you're gonna have to return to a kind of 19th century way of writing, certain kind of you know where there's like do you how wh do you see that happening? I do think the answer it? is in myth. I think the answer comes through the idea of people in ways that don't really jibe with our sense of 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 what's accurate, but that gives us hope in the human being's ability to transcend whatever the case may be, uh, simple tasks of strength, you know, like with a Hercules. Or a myth like Obama, frankly, who says, you can be a black man in America and become president. Um, you can try cocaine in, in America and become president. Uh, you can write a book about um, basically ex uh, uh, exemplifying empathy for the other on every page and become president of the United States. That's a, a kind of myth. I mean, it's not a myth because the man happened, but he's mythic in my mind, yeah. for sure. And I think that what we need to do in some ways is divert some of our truth-telling and fiction back to the myth. And I think that could be redemptive in some, some sense. Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking well, about. Yeah. What about for your next project? Is that you, you want to go to doing? Well, you know, as I said, I, I'm, I'm always uh, vacillating between do I tell the truth or do I try to do something that's a little bit different? Um, and that's, that's where I am. I've swung over because I, I don't want any more truth. We get too much of it in the damn what, what does it do to humor? I mean, you're, uh, it's very hard to be funny when you're myth, being mythic, right? Um, and one yeah, of the things that point. you have uh, is, you know, you have, and it's, I read a Paris Review interview of yours, and, you know, you guys were having this very interesting conversation about how funny writers are not taken um, as seriously in, in, a, in a critical sense as, 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 as the most serious writers. And funny's been sort of in 
you've been funny all your writing life. What are you going to do about your sense of humor? Well, you can't give that up. You give that up, all is lost. So I don't know. I mean, it's true that myths aren't all that funny. Um, I don't know. We'll have to find out. I I'm working through it. It's really interesting because um, in India, the, in, a, in a very different way, it's, it's myth. I mean, you know, the, the biggest um, sort of, this is the kind of mass market writer, but <coughs> called Amish, uh, writes these mythologies. And there's no question. And, um, at Jagannath, we have this writer's platform where we ask people to submit, like, you know, we crowdsource writing and we ask amateurs to submit writing. And the competition where we asked people to do a mythology competition had the most response. So it was, it was very interesting um, because we often try and pick, uh, like, we'll, 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 we'll tell people to write about something that we hope sort of triggers them in, or inspires them into writing, but that's the one that. So, but for very different reasons, I'm not sure it's the same reason as in America. You have a, you're coming at it from a writer's point of view that, you know, in this world where <coughs> the reality is so sort of hyperbole, it's now kind of become so absurd. How do you address it with some meaning and how do you change? I don't know, I, I haven't quite figured out why India's, what uh, India's attraction to myth is, but there's no question that there's like a global interest. Uh, yeah. In various ways, right? Yeah. I mean, the the the, in, the Indian reason is, I think, very different from the American reason. In India, I think it's it's connected to national pride. Uh -huh. So I think, uh, I mean, I've just been reading Amish, and it's all about the subtext is really that we were great once. Uh -huh. Our past was like full of extraordinary warriors, deep wisdom, great intelligence, understanding about. Uh, technologies, and we've sort of lost it now, uh -huh. but we had it. Uh -huh. um, and that is why I think mythology is so exciting or interesting for... Uh -huh. um, it, it returns you to a better time. It does, and in fact, I think most of you guys in the audience, and I don't think Joshua knows this, but we've, Jaipur Lit Fest has started in the middle of sort of the most extraordinary cultural battle in the last few years, which is the battle about this film called Padmavati. Uh, which most of you probably know in the audience, I'll just tell, which is that there was a, 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 f a fictional story about this, like a Helen of Troy story of, Ch of Rajasthan. She was this beautiful queen and the uh, evil Muslim Mughal mon Sultan, not Mughal, but the Muslim Sultan of Delhi sort of sees her and falls madly in love with her and has to win her by any means and defeats the kingdom and she um, she had commits suicide, ritual suicide with all the women in her, ha in her women's quarters. It's called Johar, where they sort of, you know, they, they jump into the, into the fire. And this is a story of like Jaipur, a Rajasthani womanhood, sacrifice. And this film's been made, and uh, the film was banned in a number of states. The Supreme Court then just did this. I mean, it's been just, uh, do, do all of you in the audience know I know that some of you are from India, some of you aren't, but it's extraordinary. So, so, so basically, this film has been made with you know one of Bollywood's top directors, with Bollywood's top stars, and uh, they, you know, there's been just month after month of controversy. It has made, and it's just uh, now uh, premiered this weekend. But a whole bunch of states, including Rajasthan, has banned it. Uh, they've refused to let it play. Uh, I think I just read a news story that in Rajasthan, so in this state. Uh, schools have been told that on Republic Day they can't play the song from that film. Uh, what's crazy is that, of course, the story didn't even happen. So mm. even as like Rajasthan's kind of insane, about, you know, insanely angry about the fact that like this this film is going to outrage their history and all of it, um, this it never happened. This isn't really connected to Rajasthani history at all. Um, and I don't know what will happen to this film. I mean, it's showing in some places, it's not showing in other places. So I don't know, it is interesting, and I know that it's sort of mythology taking its turn in China. I don't know how that's, ha I haven't sort of read enough about it. So you might be introducing a whole new world in America, Joshua. Well, in America, it takes the form of superheroes, I think, yeah. more, more often than not. It's probably the superhero, and my son is very into myths, so they still have a certainly a primal appeal. Um, like the old, you know, the Greek myths and the um, Robin Hood and Arthur, especially. I mean, Arthur has really seduced him. Um, but he's Why a big is that? Reader. What draws him about Arthur? <clears throat> um, 
the, the all the knights. It's kind of like lots of superheroes. In yeah, it's world. the knights. It's the knights and it's the fighting. I think it's it's certainly not the romance. He turns away at kisses, um, <laughs> but it's the it's the knights. It's the it's the uh, what's his name? Um, Lancelot. No, uh, the the man that I'm thinking of. He he writes. Uh, uh, Green, I think is his last name. Um, I forget the full name. He, he's written the book that, that my son has uh, read the most, and it's very romantic. It's the, the language is very romantic. I mean, not just between men and women. I mean, he's romancing the knights. And so the knights have a kind of um, immortal, um, invincible quality, and they're always going out and getting smote and smiting and the rest of it. And, I think he's just very, he, he likes bloodshed, of course, and so it's, for him, it's, very, it's sort of like the superheroes. And actually, he's turned away from superheroes, I think, because they're a little bit too invincible, frankly. You know, nobody really ever dies in the superhero movies. So, um, but it's, you know, I, and I think what you're, what you're really referring to is the reality that people take great offense when myths are pounced upon, and when some kind of element of fiction comes in and says, actually, this was the reality. And it's exactly what I'm, I'm suggesting is so disruptive to our inner lives, to the, to the nourishment of our inner lives. When, so when someone comes along and sort of pounces on a fiction that is so dearly held, the way that for so many uh, the Trump administration does in America, they, he comes sort of invades the psyche and pounds on deeply held myths about who we are as a nation, as who we are as human beings. And the destruction of that has led people to, you know, not quite do the reaction that people here have has done in reaction to that movie. But we're at that level. Everything is pitched at a super high level because so much of what we hold dear has been attacked. Um, one of the things, of course, that's constantly talked about with Trump is that that there are now, I mean, there are many Americas, of course, but there are these two Americas. There's a world that voted for Trump, and there's a world that sees him as a monster, um, and do you as a writer sort of think, gosh, there's like a whole world that maybe my books have absolutely no effect on or no impact on that I'm writing for? I mean, one of the things that I feel you're beginning to see this in the press, this idea of are we an elite that's writing for other elites? Right. And I, I don't know whether that's something. I mean, I, well, feel I, I see that in the American press. It's, there's some conversations happening here about it. I have about 130 readers. So I don't really have any, it's not news to me that I've neglected a large swath of people. Um, but I think uh, there would be no real reaching some of those people for me. They're not really interested in what I have to write about. I know those people because they're my family. I come from those people. I, um, I mean, not all of them, but I, I grew up in a very small town in Illinois, and I know ignorance, and I know bigotry, and I know um, small-mindedness. I know that stuff primitively. Um, I don't know that. I don't know that writing fiction is ever the cure for it. No. Here's what writing fiction is the cure for: bullshit, basically. If you read and write fiction and know it well, you're going to be able to read the world intelligently, and you're going to be able to discern uh, arrogance and, and cruelty and, and uh, hypocrisy and falseness much quicker than those who are not reading. And also you read because you love it, right? I sure. mean, I, mean I, sure. I sometimes think that that's, that's the, I read Sure. Queen Arthur and yeah. all the Greek myths as a kid because I just loved yeah. it and then it became yeah. a habit. And um, I want to, I want you to read a little bit from your from one of your stories and I have it on Kindle. We can see, but before that, I have, I want to test a little pet theory I have on you and you can say no, this is nonsense and I don't buy it. Which is, I've often wondered whether. Uh, when you know you had a, a you you did a bunch of stuff before you became a writer. You worked in advertising. Um, you then wrote. I was very intrigued by this. You wrote. You helped science writers improve their writing. Yeah. 
uh, and then you were kind of like obviously writing alongside this and then the writing career took off. And I had this thesis uh, of view that like when, uh, when, write, when not, uh, fiction writers in particular have done other work, that's not, so you know, I feel like there's a professionalization of creative writing now, which is in some ways fantastic. It allows a writer space and money to write. You know, you, you, you finish a creative writing degree, you get a book deal, you maybe get to teach, in a, teach creative writing in a good university, et cetera. Uh, and, they, and thus you move from your teaching to your writing and then the publication of it and then teaching and all of these things. And I wonder whether, the, you know, there used to be a generation of writers who had to work, do other things, and whether that gave them wider material to write. And certainly one of the things that was interesting about your first book is that, of course, it was very, I mean, that material was available to all kinds of writers. It, it, it isn't that, but you, you know, you, you you, you wrote about the world of everyday work yeah. and work culture. And do you feel that, do you feel the fact that you had this other life before you became a writer has held you in good stead? Is that something you value or do you feel that, no, actually, you know what, we should just all be comfy and no, no. get on with our creative writing programs and no, all no. of that? I think what it does is it reminds you that people are real. <laughs> when you go out and work, people are real. And when you enter automatic, when you go from, you know, college to a writing program, you get very confused about if you're putting it down on the pages that make it real and, and you get confused about your signifiers when you come up with names for characters and the people who actually exist and have to endure the world. And so I think you are reminded in a very visceral and permanent and meaningful way that people are living their lives and when you write about them, you should try to capture some of that um, you know, experience. You should try to actually remember that these aren't just signifiers that are meant to manipulate the reader or move the reader or whatever the case may be, but may in fact actually represent real people. And I think that's one of the most important lessons about being a, a professional in the world or just going out and, and living the world. So do you, are you ever tempted to sort of return? I mean, I can't imagine that you would be with a writing career, with a child and all of that, but I always wonder whether, do you, do you ever like ever internally worry that the, the the sources of film your material are running dry and Because they, they've paled so much since that first book? Is that what you're saying? Not really, sort of but <laughs> what I, no, what I, 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 I only mean in terms of, you know, when you have a, you're a writer who thinks deeply about what you're gonna write, and the, that, that first book had, I, I only mean that, <laughs> anyway, yeah, Josh, I, mean, I don't mean that. I've, I've just, you know what I've done, I've decided to pivot over to my family. Those are, they're real, yeah. but, and I know them very well, uh, so I'm, that's what I'm doing. I've moved from the office over to these good people. Yeah, and then you might, yeah. might do a, your own weird superhero book, yeah. right? Um, what, what do you want to read out? And I, I wanted in particular for you to read just even two pages before anyone. Are we on good time? Is there? I think they're telling us to go straight to Q&A. Oh, straight to Q&A, okay, well, then you've got to read the book. Is there time for, uh, the only reason I wanted Joshua to read even a minute is because there's really, su the flavor of the writing is very hard for me to, I mean, I hope you've got a sense of his mind and, and the flavor of his writing, but I, I wanted you to get even a more, a better sense than what my words could say. I think this is the perfect, we'll just leave it at this, oh, really? you would be blown away. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's all, I think that's the oh, perfect good. way of okay. it. Okay, and then buy the, you can buy the book and be blown away. Questions from the audience? <laughs> We're gonna go right to, no, I can't do it now. <laughs> I have to leave everybody, believe, yes ma'am. So when you're writing about these bad characters, to what extent do you find it um, easy to make them psychologically coherent? How, how, easy, how easy is it to make them psychologically coherent? Yeah. When I write about bad characters, how easy is it to make them psychologically coherent? Uh, I think that, like much of life, uh, you sort of, at least I do, I assume everybody is psychologically coherent until I start to get an indication that they're deeply off. And so, uh, you know, I start off uh, writing something and it's clear that everybody is perfectly well and then something happens or is something is said and you're like oh I need to be a little bit more back on my heels a little bit more skeptical 
and slowly it's revealed just how deeply pathological most of them are. That is my experience actually with real life. Um, you know, it doesn't happen often that I walk away from an encounter thinking that, um, oh, I've just met the person that sits very comfortably in, as the mean <laughs> of all experience, you know? Um, somebody is usually a little, so it's, it's fairly easy to start off and to present somebody as stable and sound, as I tend to think most people seem, and then to start to deconstruct that. Uh, yeah, I guess what I was meaning, not, not that people are psychologically healthy, but yeah. that when you're writing about such extreme characters, to, to kind of, that are very different, I'm presuming, from you, um, or from the kind of, ab, you know, the kind of 95% of people, to kind of try and make them psychologically coherent so that their oh, I see. behaviors I see. kind yeah. of hang together in, yeah. in the character. Um, you know, it's usually done, frankly, it's usually done through action. Um, the way that people behave in a nonverbal way is much more convincing of who they are. Um, and you can piece together the discrepancy between who they wish to present themselves to be and who they actually end up being at the end of the story. And I find that to be the most interesting sort of fictional space uh, to explore because uh, often there's a projection. I mean, it may be that you go away thinking that, that I, I'm quite different from, from pathological characters, right? He writes about them, but he's not. I'm crazy. I'm actually crazy, but I try to corral my craziness into things like writing about crazy people, um, and I get my, you know, I take my obsessions out in that direction rather than doing some of the things that my characters actually do in the world, which is shocking and a great break from the way that they present themselves. I try in my life to bring those two things together as close as I can, my actions and my, you know, my presentation. Um, I'm not always perfect at it, but you know, that's one way in which I think I remain psychologically coherent. In the cases of the stories, they're pretty, they're pretty at odds with one another, and I actually think that's a more accurate psychological portrait of human beings than you know, somebody who remains consistent from, from Ward 1. Yes. I have two brief questions. Uh, one is that if you had to choose between truth and compassion in your writing and in real life, which would you choose? And s the second question is that do your family or anyone in your family, do they ever recognize themselves as the source of your material? And if they do, how does it impact your relationship with them? Uh -huh. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I would always choose compassion, but probably always end up erring on the side of truth. You know, I would probably make a mistake and say the truth when I really meant to be more compassionate. That's kind of flaw in my personality, I think. I tend to be truth-telling when I, when I don't need to be. Um, and, and, and probably have found it difficult in the past to be the, to be the object of, of truth-telling. I know how hard it is to have my own um, weaknesses and, 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 and errors revealed, and so I should be, I should be very sympathetic to, uh, you know, that person that I, you know, that I, but I also try to live as, I try to live as uh, authentically as possible, so it's a conflict, but I would always ideally choose, com choose compassion. I have sort of tried to stay away from my family until the thing that I'm writing now. Um, they have a remarkable ability to see what's flattering in the, in, in the things that I write about, and then, and then to, to ascribe to others the things that, that they, they don't wish to be saddled with. Uh, so I would say that, you know, they, uh, they're not the clearest eyed people in the world. And so they have managed to, we've all managed to re remain on speaking terms. You know, I have to tell you a story and just to interject about this. I have a sister who writes, um, and she, she writes these quite good short stories. And she wrote a short story about our oldest childhood friend. Um, who you know is a very close person in our lives. We've grown up with her, and it's a really harsh story. And in it, she predicts the end of this girl's marriage. Um, and when I read it, I was just horrified. And I said, she, "She's going to send it to some American, a small journal, to get it published." And I said, "You can't send this because if our friend sees it, she'll never. She'll just be devastated." 
uh, and she'll never forgive you. And my sister sort of said, but I'm a writer, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, and this is my story, and you can't, you can't stop me. And of course, I couldn't stop her. And I, I got huffy and I said, if you have a moral sense, you just wouldn't do it. And she's like, fuck you, whatever. And it publishes the story, and, and this friend never recognized herself. So it was, you know, she called up my sister and said, congratulations, you've been published. Isn't it great news? Uh, and, my, and my sisters never stopped like mocking me about like my sort of moment of like, you know. <laughs> but it is interesting that no one does recognize themselves, yeah. do they? Yeah. Um, Joshua, I wanted to ask one question, which is um, how, how do writers end up having a collection of stories with the same theme? I mean, did you say to yourself, ooh, you know what, messed up men, I'm gonna write a couple of stories, see where it goes, or did you sort of, do they, do they just sort of happen spontaneously and then you look back and you say, my God, well, this is obviously something I've been obsessed about or interested by and they've sort of formed in the way they have and 11 stories have come in. How, how did the shape? Uh, kind of both ways because I had nine and then wrote two additional for this, sort of in keeping with, with um, them. So nine over the course of 15 years, and then two at the end to kind of round the collection out. So it's just sort of happened that, obviously I was interested in this direction and these people and in this way of writing fiction, and so wrote them over the course of a long period of time. And then, and then when I brought them together, I saw the similarities, I saw the connecting themes and so forth, and wrote to that end. And it occurs to me that you're so good at writing about kind of convincingly and empathetically about unpleasant people that you could write the novel about Trump. Yeah. You think that it's impossible, but surely you of all people could get into his head. Oh and God, do, that sounds no? like hell. <laughs> it just sounds like hell. Are there any other questions before we part? Yeah. Central character are primarily men in the in this set of short stories. So, any reason that women are not the central characters, or you find nothing messy about women? <laughs> um, there, are, there. My favorite story in the collection is about a woman. Uh, is the woman is the main character? Um, I tend to reserve uh, the really awful bits for men. I think because you know, I mean, if I don't think anybody needs a reminder of the awfulness of men, especially in this in what was a terrible year, 20, 000, 2017. But I think that, um, I don't, you know, it's not that women escape whipping in the, in the stories that I write about them, but I think that they're, they're a little bit more verbal, they're a little bit more in touch with their, you know, how they, how they process things, why they process things. Um, I find that to be the case in life. Uh, I don't know, that's probably a generalization, but um, you know, when I do write about women, it's much more, I think, about um, not the things that typically define male ambition and male hypocrisy. It's more about, I think it's getting into touch a little bit more with what I think of who I actually am, what I want to do with my life, what the options are, how to be fulfilled. Those things I seem to reserve for, and we haven't talked much about that, but it's also a big part of what I'm writing, you know, how to make the most out of life. Uh, what's the right way to live, not just morally, but existentially, and uh, you know, in terms of adventure, and in terms of romance, and those type of things. I tend to reserve those questions and those explorations for my female characters, and they, they pop up, but they pop up less frequently than the atrocious male ones. Are we There's good? one last fella yeah. in the back there. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Sorry, I popped out in between to buy your book, and I'm going to read it. So apologies if this question has been asked while I was away. Um, someone in the festival yesterday said, there's no truth without lies, and there's no light without darkness. Now, you seem to be writing pretty dark stories, but do you typically, at the end of it, have light and happiness, or does it just end on a dark note and one reflects about it? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the middle part of the question. Okay. Can you just repeat that? Uh, so I guess the, the question really is, while you seem to write dark stories, do they typically have optimism and a happy ending at the end, or is it just dark and people reflect on what next? What do you think? So.
<laughs> I'm gonna let, I have a view, but I'm going to let the author... There's not a hell of a lot of optimism, my friend. <laughs> you got to read it. Thanks. Enjoy. <laughs> Okay, I think that's Is it. that it? Well, look, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Joshua. That was a fantastic conversation. I really so enjoyed quickly. it. Thank you. We wish to thank Joshua Ferris and Chiki Sarkar for this delightful.